How are Agilists faring in the pandemic? How are we finding meaning and purpose in these troubled times? How can we connect, inspire, and support each other? We will explore answers to these questions and more. This is Agile Caravan Sarai. I'm Sanjeev Augustine. Kent Beck is an Agile Manifesto author and a co-creator of the wildly popular Extreme Programming or XP methodology. Kent is also the leading proponent of test-driven development or TDD. In the mid-1990s, Kent, along with Ron Jeffries and Ward Cunningham, evolved extreme software engineering practices like pair programming, test-driven development or TDD, refactoring, and such, and put them together in this framework that came to be known as XPO Extreme Programming on the now famous Chrysler C3 project. In parallel with developing those engineering practices, including automated build and test and such, Kent Ward and Ron also developed a minimalistic set of management techniques that include the planning game. Today we know the planning game as release planning and iteration planning. And so there you have it, those are the antecedents of those very popular agile practices. Kent's personal mission and one that he feels very deeply about is, as he puts it, to help geeks feel safe in the world. His mission is imbued with influences from art and music and drama and philosophy. And he really brings it down to the personal belief that no matter what our differences are at a personal level, we should and must find common ground. Two decades ago, Kent's book, Extreme Programming Explained, inspired me as a young manager of extreme programming teams. I had a few teams and we had applied XP. And as we applied these practices, we were able to deliver really quality product with zero defect to our customers with the net result that our confidence in Agile methods and XP in particular grew and our customers' interest in Agile methods grew as well. In those days, we had also scaled extreme programming using a variant of the rational unified process called DX. Pretty much no one knows about it, but it is an interesting way Uh, DX, by the way, is XP uh, written upside down, and it is a way to embed XP teams in a larger framework of the unified process. We applied that very successfully on one of the largest projects in the world in the early 2000s, and uh, that brought about a lot of success. And so over the years, what has happened is that the practices of XP, or extreme programming, have now become embedded or part and parcel of pretty much every Agile method, including Scrum and even Kanban at the team level, and also Scaled Agile Framework or SAFE and Disciplined Agile or DA at the enterprise level. So all of us in the Agile community and our customers and the people who are using Agile methods all owe that XP crew from the Chrysler project a tremendous debt of gratitude. Today, Kent continues in his mission to make the world a better place and a safer place for geeks. And so thank you, Kent, for your contribution. Now, let's hear it from Kent himself. Kent, it's great to see you. It's been a number of years since we've actually connected. Uh, I appreciate you joining me here today. Uh, I know you're a busy man. You've got a lot of stuff going on. And uh, thank you for being here, first off. Sure, Sanjeev, it is a pleasure. It's been way too long. Thanks. Glad so, to see you um, again. So for the, I have a few questions for you and I want to start with the first one. So the Agile community is coming up on the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Agile Manifesto. And we've been having conversations with authors of the Agile Manifesto. By the way, I was calling them signatories and Ron Jeffries corrected me and he said, we're authors, not signatories. So I stand corrected. Okay. So, <laughs> so as one of the 17 authors of the Agile Manifesto, uh, I wanted to just ask you, what are your reflections and anything that you, you want to share with our community looking back over the last 20 years? It's an awfully broad question. But first, <laughs> if Ron can correct you, then I can correct you too. Because I'm not I'm not one of the 17 authors. I'm the first author. Ooh. Yeah, alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering where you were going with that. <laughs> <laughs> so it is Beck et al. 
to my uh, eternal amusement. Um, uh, okay. when, in the little copyright uh, thing at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. If you if you reference the manifesto, yeah, my name comes first. Mike Beetle, God rest his soul, uh, did, did, missed out by two letters. <laughs> yeah. So, um, hmm. Reflections. So m- much. What we were trying to achieve at the time is very different in some ways, 180 degrees opposed to what has played out. Mm-hmm. Um, our, um, I'll speak for myself in this because we didn't have one voice. The, the, the manifesto itself was kind of the least common denominator of, of what we could all agree on. Mm-hmm. Um, I was interested in seeing individuals um, flourish and reach their full potential in this world of technology, which is a, it's like technology is such an odd, unprecedented um, activity because it's, it's like math in that it's, it's pure thought stuff. But it scales in the way that, in a way that mathematics doesn't. So you can you can manipulate things purely with your mind and affect the lives of billions of people at the same time. Um, and so the, the the people who tend to be uh, good at that, oftentimes not not complete, but oftentimes have kind of an odd way of thinking about the world. They, they have an odd uh, combination of strengths and weaknesses in say, you know, the classic one is social skills, something that can be difficult for people who are you good at this kind of pure mental um, manipulation. So those people oftentimes uh, have a hard time making their way in the world. And I would like and I'm like that. I would like to see people like that able to flourish, to participate in the world fully, to reach their full potential. And uh, at the time, the social structures that had built up around software development, remember this is this is back when when people used to not apologize for waterfall development. That was just the right way to do things. And it was absolutely stifling. Most of your effort was wasted. Uh, Consequences did not flow to where decisions were made. Uh, uh, Decisions didn't flow to where information existed. Um, It was just not good for anybody. Now, we've had an interesting, weird turn of events where... uh, Now people are are again, not apologizing for the waterfall. You know, you guys, you can't tell me what you're going to do with your development. So we're just going to write down exactly what we're going to do before we do it. Cause that's going to work really well. Well, doesn't work for all the reasons it never worked. What that symbolizes to me though, is that the social structures of software development really didn't change at all in the process. And that's what we were trying to, to change, not whether you have continuous integration or whether you write tests, but do the people making the decisions, do do decisions flow to information and do consequences flow to decisions? You know, do we have incentive structures in place for people to thrive to grow themselves as much as they can and to contribute what they can to the rest of society. And, and that wasn't the case 20 years ago. And it's still not the case now. Surprise, surprise. Those kind of social structures change very slowly in general, but to pretend like, uh, everything's going fine, you know, oh, well, agile, you know, and everything's, everything's brand new, and we're doing things in a different way. If those social structures haven't changed, if the incentive structures haven't changed, no, nothing's changed. So we'll come back. I I do want to come back with my last question to ask you about what perhaps what your vision to change some of that in the for the future is, but I want to segue a little bit and uh, 
I uh, sort of glom onto something you said. You said you were looking particularly as one of the as the first author of the Agile Manifesto. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, in you were most interested in helping individuals flourish and reach their full, full potential. Yes. And I know you to be a creative person yourself. Uh, you were a, a ballet um, dancer, da ballet da uh, producer, um, as, uh, uh, what's it called, a um, stage producer, and, and, and uh, multiple other things that you, you were with your guitar when you just joined me over here. Yeah, and maybe yeah. we can get you to do a little riff over there. <laughs> and you're a writer, so you have so much of this creativity uh, yourself. And one of the things uh, I wanted to check with you is, personally, how are you doing in the pandemic? Well, I'm, uh, I've been up and down the first few months. I would first two months, uh, I was pretty, um, severely depressed. Um, and then I started connecting with people kind of out of desperation and it snapped me out of it. Um, the saving grace for pandemic for me has been walking. So I, I live in San Francisco and I started walking for distance. And anytime you can't go in a straight line in San Francisco, you go up and down. Um, I like to say that it's, in San Francisco, um, Manhattan distance it is, is just a, a useless fiction because it really matters whether you go this way and that way or this way and that way, because this way might go up uh, 150 meters and down 150 meters. So I started walking and the thing about walking is exercises. It's not, you can get tired doing it. Uh, but if you, if you do it, you, you realize, Oh, you can go further. So I started going further and further and further. And um, now I'm walking sometimes 15 miles in a, a day on the weekends. And that's been hugely beneficial to me. Um, I am connected to people in, in, in ways that I wasn't before my kids, for example. Um, I have a lot of contact with most of my kids. Um, yeah, so th th that's been a big part of it. Another thing that kind of snapped me out of it is that I work at Gusto, which does a payroll and benefits payroll for small businesses in a delightful way. Um, and small businesses in America were really hurting. And <clears throat> so uh, a, a job that I'd taken because it was a genuine service for which we could charge genuine money and still had a lot of scale available, suddenly became socially relevant. Yeah. And uh, we, at, inside Augusta, we had to up our game a whole lot because requirements were suddenly changing eight times faster. You know, go into payroll, it, you know, things only change once a year, relax, it's okay. <laughs> well, all of a sudden things were changing really? weekly or sometimes daily. Yeah. And we had to really get good at agility, yeah. small a, the real stuff, agility. <laughs> um, and and uh, really pulled through for the people who the small businesses that uh, that depend on us. So th that kind of sense of purpose mm -hmm. that was also very helpful for snapping me out of of uh, of my funk. Well, that's very inspiring to hear, and thank you for that honesty. I think it's gonna uh, it'll mean a lot to our listeners out there because um, everyone is going through this, right? The world over, we're all dealing with this. We're in it together, at least for that part, the isolation, the lack of connection, and hopefully uh, folks will be able to connect with you over this interview. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's a, it, if you look at Apple Health, you can you can see, you know, I'm walking, 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 boom. Yeah. March and April, boom, just blah, blah, and then pop, blah, 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 and then more and more and more. And that's like, that's, that's not just my physical activity. That's my mental activity. Mental health goes up. <laughs> Absolutely. In a correlated way. Yeah, so I've been. I, I also have been doing a lot of create creative activities. So I'm writing fiction. I'm awesome. doing visual art. I'm doing a lot of music, and that also really helps me. If I like at the end of every day, I should have some kind of creative output, and the next day just goes a whole lot better. 
Wonderful. Well, I think that's a great uh, opportunity to segue into our uh, third and final question. Which oh, is... very smooth, Shanji. <laughs> well, I want to make sure we get it done so we get into bite-sized chunks. It's an increment, right? Yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> so um, if you're looking for a creative output and if you're looking towards uh, helping people, individuals, right? You talked about more of an industrial type structure that you wanted to go go up against. You also mentioned that it hasn't really happened. The social structures have not really changed. And if you're looking towards the future, there is you know, a lot of hope for the future. You know, there are vaccines on the horizon now. I think the, uh, the British just gave um, emergency approval to the Pfizer vaccine. So people are starting to say, okay, this, you know, we could start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, for, you know, for the for the pandemic, and, but also as you're kind of looking for the future of Agile for the next 15, 20 years, how would you sort of inspire the next generation of Agilists or even our current generation of Agilists to look to the future and say, okay, maybe we didn't do, you know, we got some great wins over there, but we still have work to do. So what's your work, advice and inspiration for folks? Well, as we look first, to the future? I'm, first, I'm going to argue that we got some great wins. <laughs> okay. Some things technically have changed, yeah. but some things technically have slid backwards too. Mm. So, I see people with hour-long build pipelines. No, no, this is this is wrong. It's wrong for all the reasons it was ever wrong. Yeah, I I sometimes wonder if if I get the causation backwards. If the pipeline, we we have this hour-long pipeline which causes us to go really slow. I wonder if the problem is really that the surrounding systems that we're a part of couldn't handle change at a higher pace. And so we kind of subconsciously create this, this bottleneck of a slow build just to make sure that the, the, the programmers and designers and product people can't make so many decisions that it would actually disrupt the surrounding structure that we're in. Right. So, Stuff like that, like just no. Think about latency, people. So uh, I am working on a thought experiment called Limbo, where the the question is, uh, uh, how low can you go? Just like the Limbo song. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how small can you make changes? So if if everyone, you know, if I extract some helper method, well you as a developer, uh, like that change could go into your code base right now. I can't have break. I can't have broken anything, but it can also go to all of production. It can go to every cell phone in every pocket around the world. Mm -hmm. It's just impractical. Well, taking things that were impractical and making them practical is the essence of progress. If you have something that's practical and you do it, whoop de doo but if you have something that's impractical and you do it, then you really have something. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's that's a thing. Now, there's a technical substrate to that. That's like, well, how do you do that? You know, there's not enough bandwidth in the world, whatever. But I, what I'm really interested in is the social structures that would emerge from that. Mm. So people say, whoa, but... But if you don't have code review, then people are going to be breaking stuff all the time. Well, y wake up. People are breaking stuff all the time with code okay. review. So how's that any worse? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'm playing with is a strict separation between structural changes and behavioral changes. Hmm. So structure changes are reversible. You know, if I extract a helper and then I inline it, no harm, no foul. It, it, it does, you know, I can undo it. If I if I change the behavior of the system so that IRS reports report different numbers and I send them to the IRS, that's a reverse, <laughs> that's irreversible. <laughs> right? That's it's a whole different class. Yeah. Absolutely. So how would I work if I did this make the change easy, mm -hmm. then make the easy change style, mm -hmm. as opposed to lumping it all together? That's the that's the essence of a, a book I'm working on called Tidy First Question Mark about mm -hmm. software design and, and its application. Wonderful. So <clears throat> at another level, though, I'm what I'm interested in is uh, incentive structures. 
So I'm working on replacements for the annual performance review process. I think the performance review, like who cares? Yeah. It's already done. I uh, The company already paid me for all of that behavior. Reviewing it, like, no, I'm, what I'm interested in is what's, how am I going to do better next? Right. Not whether I did good or bad previous. Right. So, so w- what replaces, there's a, there's a legitimate need to evaluate performance and to encourage future growth. I, I, I understand that. And, you know, pe- some people aren't, should contribute to society for another employer. I understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, but <clears throat> how, how do you create a, po- a more positive incentive structure than people scrambling for scraps falling off of the pie? Um, so those are the kinds of things I'm looking towards. And I don't think it really fits under the umbrella of agility much at all. Well, it, it does and it doesn't because we're talking about agility, but you can't have agility unless we change behavior. We can't have agility un- un- unless we change the social structure. We can't have agility unless we change a performance review and the, that's a social and a bureaucratic structure on, under which people are operating, right? So. Uh, maybe not directly, but indirectly, it, it, it's absolutely, I see it as part of a system that all, all of it needs to change if you're going to have real progress. Yeah, the problem, I mean, and this comes back to, and maybe this is the closing, my closing comment on this, goes back to the fundamental weakness of agility as a brand mm. is it's too attractive. Everybody wants to say that they are. Yeah. It's like Think structured programming. Nobody's going to say they do unstructured programming. We're, we're agile. No, we're, we're rigid. Yeah. We're inflexible. Yeah. No, nobody's going to say that. And so there's an incentive for everybody to pile into yeah. ag- agility, capital A agility. That's, I took a lot of heat for calling it extreme programming. Mm-hmm. But the thing about extreme right. is nobody's going to say that unless they've earned it. That's right. And they're willing to say, no, I'm an extreme programmer. Yeah. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Hey, you know, bite me. The, <laughs> I, I earn my stripes. Yeah. This is a, this is a, I, it really means something. Yeah. And, and that, that was something that came up at that original meeting. Mm-hmm. That was my objection. I didn't have a better alternative. Yeah. So I'll go along with it. But in the end, that prediction has played out and everybody piles in with the same social structures, the same dysfunctional communication patterns, the same dysfunctional responsibility and consequence patterns. And lo and behold, the inputs are the same, the outputs are the same. Yeah. So maybe the, our next 20 years is about getting extreme with agil- agility and not ex- expecting agile to be something that we can sprinkle on like fairy dust and expect it to work like magic. Well, it's it, it, it if it's frosting, the cake's going to say the same. Yeah. It needs to be a foundation to mix the metaphor, on which you build something that's different, and that different thing is going to be uncomfortable at first, yeah. because you're going to be doing things in ways that you haven't seen them done before, and you won't have anybody to point to and blame if things go wrong. You're going to have to stand up and say, "Hey, this is on me." Yeah. Well, that's uncomfortable. Boo hoo. <laughs> So thanks for that, uh, Kent. Um, I do want to ask you for a special favor, if you're up to it. Sure. You want to send us out with a little uh, riff on your guitar? Uh, uh, well, let's uh, let's go with uh, yeah, sure. So I always have a, a strat sitting next to my. Uh... There you go. Thank you so much. I- I really appreciate your time. All right, Sanjeev, take it easy. Good to see you again.